that he has worked there, in fact, since 1981? Yes. In your position as chief medical examiner, are you familiar with approximately how many autopsies he has performed in the course of the time he has been with your office? I think over 5,000 plus. Doctor, do you consider Dr. Golden to be a personal friend of yours? Yes, he's also a colleague. As you sit here today, how do you feel about testifying in this case? Objection. Overruled. You may answer. I'm here to present truthfully and accurately the coroner's findings on the two victims uh, who uh, died, Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, uh, so that the jury can understand the coroner's process and know the truth uh, about all the findings uh, and any errors which were committed by the office, uh, acknowledge them and uh, basically explain the cause and manner of death. Oh, well. Proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, have you found in your review of all the materials you have reviewed that Dr. Golden made mistakes in the course of conducting autopsies on Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Golden? Goldman? Excuse me. He has made some mistakes, yes. And we're going to get into this in much greater detail later. Have you been asked to evaluate as to any such mistake? the significance of the mistake on a variety of issues? Yes, I have been asked to review the significance. Have you done that? Yes. Doctor, from your findings of whatever mistakes were made, is it difficult for you to be here today to testify? No. Oh, well. No. Now, Doctor, uh, you've, going back just to your uh, curriculum vitae, do you have any teaching appointments at the present time? Yes, I do. What are they? I'm a clinical professor at USC School of Medicine, both in medicine and pathology. I'm also an assistant professor, uh, not assistant, associate professor at UCLA School of Medicine in pathology. What do those responsibilities entail? Uh, the residents from both these institutions rotate in the Department of Coroner, and I'm involved in their training in forensic pathology. They do monthly rotations. Uh, I also give lectures uh, when requested by these institutions to their staff. Uh, I am also involved in the medical student rotations at USC School of Medicine. How long have you been uh, with those affiliations? With UCLA, uh, I'm been an associate professor since 1992. Uh, with the USC, I have been since 1979. Uh, but as I told you, I started as an assistant professor at USC, moved up to associate professor, and now I'm a full professor. Doctor, in the clinical series, clinical series. Doctor, you've indicated that you have testified before in court as a result of cases that you have handled as a forensic pathologist. Is that correct? Yes. Approximately how many times have you testified in court as an expert in forensic pathology? hundreds of times in this county. Testified a few, uh, fewer times in San Bernardino, Kern, and uh, San Diego counties. Testified uh, in Los Angeles federal court and also federal courts in Virginia and uh, Las Vegas. Have you ever testified as a witness called by a defendant in a criminal case? Uh, not that I recall on a criminal matter, but I have been called by the Public Defender's Office to testify to the findings, but mainly I testify for the prosecution on criminal matters. I think the Public Defender's Office would feel slighted if you didn't recognize them as lawyers who represent people charged with crimes. Uh, it, it's the same. Phrase the question. Doctor, what's your understanding of who the Public Defender's Office represents? They represent the defendants and uh, when they request me to come on a case uh, to explain certain findings, I have done that, but mainly on criminal prosecutions, I've testified for the prosecution. In civil cases, I've testified for both. When you say both, what do you mean? Plaintiff and defense. Plaintiffs in what kind of cases, doctor? These are m malpractice cases which come to court. Uh, sometimes there is civil litigation on uh, the mechanics of a vehicle which caused a traffic accident. So in these kind of situations, both the defense and the prosecution approach you. Doctor, from your experience, is it common that 
deputy medical examiners or chief medical examiners are commonly called by the prosecution in criminal cases? Yes. Oh. Doctor, can you estimate for us approximately how many hours you have put in in preparing to testify here today, evaluations and so forth? Uh, I would say uh, at least about 100 plus hours with uh, the uh, you and Mr. Ken Lynch, and I spent hundreds of other hours with coordinating, coordinating release of reports, working with the defense attorneys uh, on different issues when they called us. Uh, so I would say a couple of hundred hours in the last uh, one year. D doctor, in that couple of hundred hours, have you received any additional compensation from whatever your salary may be for the additional time you've worked on this case? No. Are you still expected to do your work as the responsibilities of the chief medical examiner are defined? Yes. Have you done that? Yes. When do you find the time to work on this case? I start early uh, whenever I'm uh, re required to meet with uh, the prosecution team. And I work late in the evening sometimes and uh, uh, work at my off hours at home. Doctor, you've indicated a number of hours that you believe you've worked with Mr. Lynch and myself uh, in prep uh, pre uh, preparation for testifying here today. What is the content of that preparation if it's something other than shooting the breeze and having coffee? I would say 100 hours. We have worked. What have we been doing for 100 hours? Uh, there have been several processes involved in the different meetings. One was to uh, evaluate the photographs and understand the injuries depicted in the photographs. Uh, that was one aspect of our meeting. The other aspects were uh, preparing uh, the uh, justification of the photographs uh, for introduction into evidence so that the coroner's findings may be, prepared, uh, may be presented in a proper manner. Uh, we, we were also involved in reviewing literature on time of death issues, and I assisted in the process of preparing the charts uh, to, to discuss the time of death issue. Doctor, can you estimate about how much literature you've reviewed um, in the course of preparing for your testimony? A uh, couple of textbooks and several articles. And approximately how much time you have uh, devoted to just reading the literature? Several hours on each, on each of the books and some of the articles. I'm sorry, several hours on each of the books or several hours combined? No, several hours on each of the books and articles. Now, Doctor, have you been given any instructions or requests by either myself or Mr. Lynch with respect to what is expected from you as you testify here as a witness today? Basically, to tell the truth and to uh, bring out all the coroner's findings and present them to this jury and the public as I see it. Have we suggested in any way how your findings should be or what your findings should be? No. And would you, in fact, allow us to do that? No. First of all, I'm the doctor and you're the lawyer, and I'm supposed to present the medical findings. There's no way you can coach me on medical findings. Have we tried to coach you in any way? No. Doctor, uh, besides your teaching responsibilities, are you a member of certain recognized organizations in the fields of medicine? Yes, I am. What are they? I am the, I'm a fellow of the American College of Physicians. I'm a fellow at the College of American Pathologists. I'm a fellow in the Royal College uh, of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in the Division of Medicine. I am a member of the Infectious Disease Society of America. I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. I'm a member in the National uh, Association of Medical Examiners. I'm a member of the Los Angeles Society of Pathologists. Doctor, are these uh, organizations, number one, that you join just by paying dues? Uh, you have to pay dues, but to be eligible for membership, you must have achieved certain competence in the field uh, because 
for example, the American College of Physicians, uh, to become a fellow, you not only must be board certified in internal medicine uh, or subspecialties and have published some articles. In College of American Pathologists, you have to be board certified in pathology before you become a fellow of the American College of American Pathologists. For the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, you have to be certified by the Royal College before you get fellowship. For the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, uh, in addition to being a forensic scientist, you have to have actively taken part in some of the academy meetings, presented papers, which I have done, and then you get elected to be a fellow after having been a member for several years. For the Infectious Disease Society, you have to be board certified in infectious diseases to be a member of the Infectious Disease Society of America. To be a Los Angeles Society pathologist uh, member, you have to be an active pathologist in the Los Angeles County. Uh, as far as the National Association of Medical Examiners, you must be a certified forensic pathologist to be a member of the National Association of Medical Examiners, but they do take board eligible forensic pathologists also. Does the term fellow that you've used with respect to several of the organizations have any particular meaning? Yes, uh, that is a special recognition to your years, years of experience and qualifications in addition to other requirements. Doctor, you mentioned, I think, briefly something about uh, literature uh, as far as articles. Are these articles in which you either alone or with others wrote uh, the content of the articles? Yes. Tell us a bit about uh, your literature. I've uh, written uh, articles on deaths from uh, disapromide, uh, flecainide. I've uh, co-authored articles on uh, crossbow injuries. Uh, I've worked on uh, an article with a case report on tuberculous iotitis. Uh, also uh, uh, written articles on identification of dose uh, by using pacemakers, dentures. Uh, those are some of the publications there in the bibliography there. Approximately how many publications do you have? I think about 11. And are you also involved in something that's called an abstract, separate and apart from the actual articles? Yes. What is an abstract? Abstract is you present a paper in a national meeting and uh, you present a particular topic to an audience and uh, that gets uh, published in that uh, meeting uh, 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 handout. Uh, and it also includes a presentation of posters which would picking a particular topic and demonstrating it in the form of a poster. And I've done Can about. You explain that a little bit. What What do you mean by demonstrating on a poster? Uh, if If you If let's say you're doing uh, sex determination by pubic remains, you uh, take different photographs of from different victims, uh, the pubic uh, symphysis uh, region, and uh, demonstrate what are the features which help you to identify a person from those features, and that'll be one kind of poster presentation. The other poster presentation could be on any other topic, the way you want to present it. It could be uh, photographic or literature searches, uh, documenting and supporting the evidence you want to present. Approximately how many abstracts have you been involved with? I think uh, uh, at least uh, nearly a two dozen, and I have the exact number here. Do you have a copy of the curriculum vitae that we've previously marked as Exhibit 295? Yes. And uh, that'll allow you to refresh your memory as to the exact number? Yes. Please do so. Publications were 11, as I mentioned, and abstracts and poster presentations uh, were 20. Doctor, uh, is there anything else that you would like to bring to our attention dealing with your education, your experience, your training, which allows you to practice in the area of forensic pathology? Well, I think I covered uh, everything I wanted to say. Now, Doctor, I'd like to move to a, a completely different topic. On June 13th, 1994, did you learn that there were two criminal homicide cases presented at your office involving Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman? Yes. Have you prepared, at your direction, photographs which will show us the process that is followed with respect to those two bodies or any other bodies that are suspected criminal homicides from the time they arrive at your office through the time of autopsy? Yes. Before we start with the photographs, 
would you please define for us what is an autopsy? An autopsy is a examination of a, a human body with the sole purpose of determining the cause and manner of death and also diagnosing the disease processes the person may or may not have had. Uh, this is an internal, this includes an external examination of the body. Uh, and in a forensic autopsy, you look for identifying characteristics like scars, tattoos. You also document any injuries as you do that process. Uh, and the documentation of the injuries and these identifying characteristics take place on diagrams prescribed by the coroner's office. Photographs are taken and following this process, the internal examination is done. And the internal examination is an organ by organ dissection by the pathologist, looking at the various organs of the body. And if the death is from firearm injuries or sharp force injuries, you document the trajectory of the injuries, recover projectiles if they are from death from firearms. And at the during the process also you save body tissues and fluids for any toxicological analysis you may need to do. You save tissues for any microscopic analysis you need to do. And following the autopsy process, uh, you document all the findings and later you dictate them, which becomes a transcribed autopsy process. Now the autopsy process also will include collection of any evidence before the autopsy, which will be in the external examination stage, uh, at which time the photographs are also taken. And sometimes x-rays are taken before the autopsy to document location of projectiles if the death is from firearms. And that gives you a rough summary of the process. Basically, you have an external examination, an internal examination, evidence collection before autopsy, tissue fluid collection during autopsy for various purposes, Conclusion of the process, you determine the findings, assimilate the findings, and make a diagnosis as to the cause of death. And then the doctor issues the uh, findings as to the cause of death, and a death certificate is issued, which is the final uh, work product of the coroner's office, determining the cause of death and doctor, manner of death. All the documents that you've talked about, the diagrams and so forth, are these documents which are expected to be completed by the deputy medical examiner at or shortly after the time of the actual observation of whatever is being diagrammed? Yes. And is the autopsy protocol the term that is used for this transcribed document which reflects in words the observations made by the medical examiner? Yes. Is that autopsy protocol something which is expected to be completed shortly after the autopsy has been performed. Yes. And in your office, is there a time frame with which the medical examiner is expected to comply in order to have the transcription prepared? The medical examiner has about 24 hours to dictate the findings, and but generally most of the doctors dictate the findings the same day soon after the autopsy. The document <coughs> of the injuries are done on the diagrams. Uh, doctor, in the course of your review of the information in this case, did you learn as to whether or not an investigator from the coroner's office was dispatched to 875 South Bundy in Los Angeles County on June 13, 1994? Yes. Who or who, if it's more than one, was dispatched? The investigator who was dispatched to 875 South Bundy was Ms. Claudine Ratcliffe. Separately, also, one of our forensic attendants responded to the scene, and that was Mr. Jacobo. What are the qualifications of an investigator such as Claudine Radcliffe? Maybe we should start with what is she expected to do when she goes to 875 South Bundy as a coroner investigator? They have several responsibilities. One of the responsibilities is to uh, talk to the, uh, in this particular case, it was a criminal uh, death investigation which was being conducted as two dissidents had expired, I mean two dissidents had, uh, were involved and Ms. Ratcliffe had to uh, discuss the circumstances with the law enforcement officials who were there uh, 
this is one of the functions to collect the circumstances uh, and make that available to the medical examiner. The other responsibility is to establish identification of the dissidents, uh, collect data which will help in that process. How is that done? What kind of data? Uh, well, uh, one is if there's uh, f family members available, visual identification, sometimes from California driver's license, and uh, sometimes from passports. Uh, this is a m one method of, uh, which is used at the scene, uh, or somebody may know the person. The, uh, shall I continue? Or? Please. The other responsibility for the investigator is to collect parameters for the medical examiner uh, with reference to time of death, which is the Riga mortis, the Alga mortis, and the Riga mortis, estimate of those parameters. I think you uh, mentioned Riger twice and Liver once. Did you mean to say a different? Uh, no, I said Liver, uh, Alger, and uh, Riger. All right, so three different components? Yes. What are the, the um, training procedures or what is the training provided for somebody like Ms. Radcliffe to perform that task? Uh, Sustain the phrase question. Does Ms. Radcliffe have any specialized training provided by your office to accomplish that function that you've just identified? Oh, well, you can answer the question. She is trained by uh, the, uh, her, during the initial part of her career as how to estimate Riga mortis uh, and uh, also the, uh, taking the liver temperature to estimate the uh, temperature decrease after death. We'll get into that in greater detail. What other responsibilities does Ms. Radcliffe have when she goes out to the scene? Yeah. The next response, I've mentioned uh, three already. The fourth responsibility to take at scene photographs so that the medical examiner has an idea what really occurred at the scene because our doctors don't go to the scene on every uh, case and the investigators are the eyes and ears of the medical examiner and they obtain information for us, as I mentioned earlier. They also take at scene photographs, which gives us a better uh, feeling of what happened at the scene or the condition of the body in which they saw the dissident. Uh, the other aspect of their uh, responsibility is before, to... I'm sorry, before you go further, let me clarify or ask some clarifying questions. More With respect... <coughs> With respect to the um, photographs, assuming that there's a police agency involved in the investigation and there is a police agency with a photographer at the scene of the body or bodies that the investigator is going to uh, observe and handle, what kind of photographs do you expect from the investigator vis-a-vis -vis what you would leave to the police agency to obtain? The police agencies take a more detailed, uh, uh, f they obtain many photographs of the scene, which gives you more detail. Whereas our investigator just takes some Polaroid photographs to uh, uh, give us uh, an idea about the location of the body and its relationship to the surroundings to the extent possible. We only take Polaroid photographs. Would you like to take a sip? Yes. Now, Doctor, what is the responsibility that the investigator like Ms. Radcliffe has vis-a-vis -vis the responsibility of the police agency investigators dealing with the victim's body? The, the examination of the body is the purview of the coroner's investigator. The law enforcement investigators do not deal with the examination of the body. The examination of the body is under the coroner's domain. Doctor, you said that uh, doctors do not go on every case, that medical examiners do not go on every case to the scene where the bodies are located. Is that uh, an accurate statement of what you yes. said? Yes, yes. How frequently do you go? Only uh, if there's a, a special need to go, uh, like the last time I went to a scene was when of my, one of my doctors expired, so I went to the scene. Uh, but generally, we don't have the staffing to allow that. We do send all our doctors in training to go to the scene. Doctor, in your opinion, would it be a better practice to have one of your doctors at the scene 
than to rely, as you say, on the investigator to be the eyes and ears of the medical examiner. It, it would be a good practice to have that also happen. In your opinion, doctor, is the fact that you or a deputy medical examiner from Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office did not go to 875 Bundy on June 13th, but rather Ms. Radcliffe was sent, does that affect in any way your ability to determine the issues that you have reviewed in this case? Sustained. Doctor, from your review of the information that you have been provided, is there anything which you believe you would have been able to obtain that would have given you significant information not provided in the materials you have? Oh, well. You may answer the question. Uh, it, it would have been nice for one of our doctors to go to the scene, but I don't think uh, we lack any other information we need to provide the opinion we need to provide. Why is that, doctor? Uh, because the different uh, objectives you you try to meet when you go to the scene is being met by our coroner's investigator who is pretty well trained to obtain that information. And in our office, um, this has been the practice for several ever, years, ever since I joined, and I find that though going to the scene does help, if a trained investigator collects the information you need, it provides uh, enough basis uh, for our opinions. Doctor, as part of your review of the information in this case, have you personally visited 875 Bundy? Yes, I have visited the site uh, twice. And were you um, uh, able, when you visited the site, to look in the areas where from photographs you learned that the bodies of Mr. Goldman and Ms. Brown Simpson were found? Yes. Were you also able to examine the um, environment surrounding that area, including trees, plants, walls, steps, things of that nature. Yes. Now, were there any other, uh, I, I think you were going on to another um, responsibility of Ms. Radcliffe before I interrupted you with some clarifying questions. Were there any other responsibilities? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I mentioned identification. I uh, mentioned uh, collecting circumstances. I mentioned collecting parameters of time of death. I mentioned at scene photographs. The other two aspects of the coroner's investigator is preservation of the property of the dissident, and most importantly, notifying the next of kin, because the next of kin may not necessarily be there at the residence, and they have our responsibility in our office also is notify the next of kin that their loved one has unfortunately died and let them know what the circumstances are. So these are roughly the major responsibilities of the investigator, which I wanted to bring up here. Doctor, is there also um, latitude provided to the investigator with respect to calling a criminalist who is employed by the medical examiner's office to the scene? Yes. I think we're going to get into that subject a little later, but would that be an additional possible responsibility of the investigator? Yes. Anything else? Uh, Basically, I think I've given you the highlights of the coroner's investigator's responsibilities. Now, you said another person was dispatched as well as Ms. Radcliffe to the uh, 875 Bundy location. Who was that? that by, was by title or position or something, and we'll get a name in a moment if you know it. Mr. Jacobo. I guess we'll get a name now. Uh, what's the position? He's a, he was a forensic uh, mortuary attendant at that time. That uh, is a fancy title for doing what? Uh, they help in uh, transporting the remains from a scene uh, to the main office. They're also responsible for initial processing of the remains in our office, which includes fingerprinting, uh, 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 measuring the height, weight, etc. Is there a form that the investigator uses that is part of the regular procedure with criminal homicide cases to record the measurements height and weight obtained by a person such as Mr. Jacobo when the bodies are returned to the uh, medical examiner's office? Yes. Are there any other responsibilities that Mr. Jacobo would be expected to have in June of 1994? Uh, basically, the responsibilities already mentioned. Is Mr. Jacobo under the direction of Ms. Radcliffe at the scene? 
Yes. Do they go in the same car or van, or do they go separately if there is a usual practice? They go in separate vehicles. And is that the usual practice? Yes. Is that what, in fact, happened here? Yes. Your Honor, may I have just a moment to talk to Mr. Ferretlow? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, I believe at this time we do have some photographs taken at the direction of Dr. Lakshmanan, uh, which are on the laser disc, as Mr. Ferretlow confirms for me. Um, I understand we can print out the photograph after it's been shown, and so I would recommend that we use the printout as the exhibit and just right. do them sequentially, starting with 296 uh, on. All right, people's 296, next photo in order. Photo 06, please. Doctor, what are we looking at in this particular photo, which will be Exhibit 296? Uh, you're looking at a coroner's van, uh, side view. Without this, is, this would be the vehicle which Mr. Jacobo would have taken to the scene to bring back the, remain, the dissidents back to the office. Doctor, I don't think we want to have to send you to a chiropractor. I don't know if there's a, a more readily seen screen. Yes, you, uh, right, just to, your, yeah. to your right, doctor. There should be a, to your right. The other right, doctor. There you go, right there. Mr. Kelvin. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Doctor, um, is this the actual vehicle or just a representative sample? This is the actual vehicle, not the actual vehicle, one of the vehicles. But as far as shape and uh, design, is this basically the type of vehicle that Mr. Jacobo took? Yes. Where is this van parked in this photograph, 296? This is parked in the garage area of the coroner's office. I think you may have to swing the microphone. Yes. Thank you, Doctor. It's parked in the garage area of the coroner's office. And what uh, is the process that is expected to take place at that location when the bodies are brought back? Uh, the uh, remains are uh, removed from the van, and the, they're taken to a room adjoining the garage there, wherein uh, their height and weight is taken. Can we? Is there anything else that uh, this photograph depicts that is of consequence to your practice and procedure? Uh, nothing else I see here. Could I have photo 08, please, Mr. Farrell? And could this be 297, Your Honor? 297. What are we looking at in this photo, Doctor? Uh, if I point here, will that be pointing there, Your Honor? Uh, he needs to point. I think uh, we've learned from experience that Mr. Ferretlow may be a better pointer. <coughs> if you could direct Mr. Ferretlow to the portion of the photograph you wish him to highlight, please do so, Doctor. Right, there's an, there should be an arrow. Okay, the you. arrow is currently uh, pointing to a gurney, and if the arrow moves to the side, you have the uh, uh, drying racks. There are three of them. Uh, this photograph is of the same garage area where you saw the van parked. And what you're seeing is the gurneys and the drying racks which uh, have been washed and are drying in the, uh, uh, the actually the clothing, uh, uh, the clothing are hung in these drying racks. And uh, they've been washed and they're allowed, allowed to be dried in the uh, garage area. Is this where they are routinely cleaned, that is these drying racks? Yes. And will they be then taken to another area from this garage for use? Yes, they are taken to the photographic area uh, when they are completely dry. And one point I want to make here, if the arrow can go uh, move downwards a little bit, you can see the, uh, there's a pan there, and that's the uh, drip pan. And there are shelves available in the uh, drying rack so the location of the pan can be adjusted to the length of the clothing. A and the other point I want to make is the drying pan is also uh, turned here so that uh, it, any material, uh, any remaining water will be completely dry before the, the rack is taken back inside, at which point the pan will be turned upside down so that it would really serve the pan purpose. 
or perhaps right side up? Yes. Is it accurate to say that this is upside down from how the pan appears when it's being used? Yes. Why do you have a pan? So that any material which is uh, dripping from the clothing can also be collected if necessary. And why do you need to adjust the level of the pan? Because you have different lengths of clothing. Uh, sometimes you may have a jacket which is longer and uh, depending on the length of the clothing, you could adjust the level of the pan. In a criminal homicide case at your office, doctor, how many different cases are at the same time placed in one of these drying racks? Usually only one clothing from one particular case is placed in the drying rack. Why do you do that? So that we can separate uh, each person's uh, clothing uh, and number one and also for purposes of evidentiary uh, preservation. You said usually. Does that in, uh, indicate that sometimes that is not the case? Uh, in rare, uh, uh, I mean not rare, in sometimes when we have an increased number of homicide cases and we only have a certain number of racks available, then the pan and the pan, the same drying rack could be used for two dissidents with the, uh, if, see when you turn the pan upside down, there's also a hanger space available. Underneath uh, the pan? It's actually in the photograph you see it above the pan. But when you turn the pan, it'll serve as a drying uh, uh, hanger rack. Is where the arrow, Mr. Fairlow has the arrow now, is Yes, that? yes, yes. And uh, so if you have two cases, uh, Sometimes we do use the same drying rack for two cases, but that's not a normal procedure. From your review of the materials in this case, was the clothing of each of the decedents, Nicole Brown Simpson and Mr. Goldman, placed in a separate drying rack? Yes. Now, Doctor, what are these gurneys that are also in this photograph used for? Uh, they are the uh, gurneys on which the uh, remains are placed uh, for uh, in the office for purpose of examination, autopsy, and storage till they are released. And is a gurney like this used uh, to remove the body of, for example, Mr. Goldman from the van that we've seen in the earlier photo? Yes. And take it somewhere? Yes, I says that it goes to the next adjoining room. Uh, if we could have Mr. Fairlow 09, please. People's Exhibit uh, 298. 298. Thank you, Your Honor. What are we looking at in this photo, 298? You're, you're seeing the weighing scale and a, a height measuring device there, uh, which is uh, uh, leaning against the wall. The weighing scale is pretty self-evident. Uh, uh, Do you want to get the arrow moved somewhere, yes, Doctor? The, could you move the arrow down, please, and uh, to the weighing scale? You can see the a dial there, and then the entire floor area is the weighing scale where the gurney is moved on and uh, the weight is taken. And of course, the weight of the gurney is adjusted so that we get the proper body weight. And in this photograph, Doctor, do you also see this measuring device? Yes, on the left side, uh, uh, I mean, on the, on the right side of the weighing scale. Just move the air a little more to the right side. That, that, as you can see, that, that's the measuring device. If you'll keep your voice up, please, doctor. That is a measuring device. I think we have a better picture coming up of that. How is um, the uh, measurement of the body length taken? Using that device, usually from the, uh, it's placed next to the body, and the height is taken from the uh, feet to the top of the head. If we could have photo 12, please, Mr. Ferretlow. And I think the arrow is in a pretty appropriate location. There's something in front of the scale, doctor. What is that? Uh, that is the measuring device I, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, to take the height. Now, doctor, uh, is, there a, is there a specific numbered form on which this information is to be placed as a part of the official record of the coroner's office for uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and a separate one for Ronald Goldman? Yes, uh, they place it on the form one of the investigator's uh, report. It's also recorded in the fingerprint cards. Mr. Carroll. Your Honor, uh, we have a document that's going to go up. Uh, may this be marked as 
I believe exhibit it might be appropriate as 298A. 298A? Yes. Have you shown that to Mr. Shapiro? Uh, they've seen them all. It's a form one. All right, proceed. Thank you. Doctor, in general terms, if you can see, what is this document 298A? It's the form one of the coroner's investigator's uh, report. And perhaps, Mr. Fairlow, if you could zoom in at the top portion of the document. Thank you. Doctor, the handwritten entries that appear uh, on the first line, Brown, Simpson, Nicole, and so forth, is that information that is written in by the investigator? Yes. And in this case, that would be Ms. Ratcliffe? Yes. And if we look, and perhaps, I don't know if we have an arrow available with this device. Um, doctor, is there a place on the form that's visible now to reflect the height and weight obtained from Ms. Brown Simpson? Yeah, the arrow is just uh, below the weight. And if you move the arrow a little more to the uh, this left of, uh, left, uh, left of it, the other side, the other side, the right. I'm sorry, your right is my left, okay. Uh, that is 65 inches, that is the height. So that's the height, and the next number you see, which you just saw, is the weight, 129 pounds. 65 inches is 5 feet 5 inches, doctor? Yes. And she weighed 129 pounds? Yes. And the other information in general terms, if we could back up just a bit, uh, Mr. Fairlow, to show the document in fuller form. The other type of information generally that is to be placed on this document by the investigator is what? Uh, you get the information of the next of kin uh, as, you, as you move down further, it gives you the place of death, uh, uh, who pronounced the person, uh, uh, and then you have the information on uh, uh, the investigating agency. Uh, and, and you also have the uh, uh, relationship of the dissident to the surroundings. Then your information on the liver temperature, the uh, environmental temperature, and on the right side, you're seeing the uh, description of uh, the opinion on the uh, liver mortis and riga mortis. If Mr. Fairlow could could leave the uh, arrow where we are right now. Um, doctor, is this one of the uh, pieces of information that you expect the investigator to observe and record to assist you in evaluating a range for time of death? Yes. And if, you, if Mr. Fairlow could move the arrow down another, is that another aspect of the information you expect the investigator to get for this purpose? Yes. And if you, Mr. Fairlow can turn the arrow around or move it all the way to the left of the document as we are looking at it, the other left. Thank you. Is this the other aspect dealing with temperature measurement that you expect the investigator to obtain? That arrow is moving too quickly for me. Uh, investigator to obtain to evaluate and estimate to evaluate and estimate range for time of death. Yes, uh, the environmental temperature is uh, 70 degrees there, and then the liver temperature is uh, 82, and the other term used for environmental temperatures, ambient temperature. Doctor, there appears to be next to those temperature readings a column for time and a column for date. Is all of this information provided by Ms. Ratcliffe? Yes. And what is the time column expected to reflect? It is, uh, it reflects the time that environmental temperature was taken. And down below under the, what appears to be 1045, is that correct? Yes. And then you have uh, below that is 1050 when the liver temperature was taken on Ms. Brown Simpson. And both of these were done at the scene on June 13, 1994? Yes. Now, Mr. Ferretlow, if we could have page 49, please. Okay, we have just a moment with Mr. Ferretlow.
Your Honor, these documents appear to contain uh, addresses and phone numbers regarding next of kin and so forth, and Ms. Clark has quite appropriately informed me of this, and I'm not certain that's information that uh, should be a matter of public record. We are attempting to... Um, All right. Do you have anything else you can do to move on? Because we have about three or four minutes left in our... This was going to be basic. I, my understanding was the court was going to conclude at 12. Uh, I think if Mr. Farrell can just actually... He's got tape and measure ready, so I think we're going to be able to do it. My only concern, Your Honor, is in the printed exhibit 298A, uh, I would ask... We can go back and reconstruct that. I'm Thank sure you. there'll be no objection. All right. Proceed. Thank you. Now, Doctor, looking at the form that's up here now, Your Honor, may this be marked as 298B as in boy? 298B. Is this basically the same form? Quick modification. I think I have a simpler way to do it. We'll we'll get the exhibit taken care of at a later time. If I, Mr. Farrell, may I have yes. Your Honor, may I have just this one page document marked as two ninety eight B? Two ninety eight B. May I approach again? You may. Doctor, showing you 298B, are you familiar with this document? Yes. In essence, is this the same form that we were just looking at, 298A, except this time it is to reflect the findings of Ms. Radcliffe concerning Mr. Goldman? Yes. Does the document reflect height and weights for Mr. Goldman? Yes, it does. What are they? The height of Mr. Goldman is 69 inches and the uh, uh, weight is 171 pounds. 69 inches is 5 uh, feet 9 inches? That's correct. And does this document also reflect the parameters that you were talking about in the other document regarding time of death uh, aspects? Yes. And uh, with respect to the air or ambient and liver temperatures, that we saw in the Exhibit 298A as 70 and 82 for liver, are those the readings that Ms. Radcliffe recorded for Mr. Goldman? Yes, but she recorded them at a different time. What are the times of the air temperature? I believe we saw before it was 1040. 1045 for Ms. Nicole. Mr. Goldman was done at 1035, the ambient temperature, and the liver temperature was done at 1040. Uh, do one would explain further? Or? Uh, just so we have the uh, sequence correct, that according to Ms. Radcliffe's record, Mr. Goldman's uh, air temperature was taken first? Yes. At 1035? That's what is recorded here. Okay. And then his liver temperature was taken at 1040? Yes. And according to 298A, Ms. Brown Simpson's air temperature, the surrounding air temperature of 70, was taken at 1045? Yes. And the liver temperature was taken at 1050. Is that correct? Yes. Your Honor, I think that concludes. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to conclude the presentation of the testimony for the morning. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Do not form any opinions about the case. Don't allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. Do not conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you. And as far as the jury is concerned, we will stand in recess until Monday morning at 9 a.m. I'll see counsel back here, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Uh, uh, Kelberg at uh, 145 for our discussions. And then let me see counsel at the sidebar with the court reporter, please. All right. Uh, and Dr. Lakshaman, we'll see you.